Welcome back. Well, one of the key drivers of inflation these days is energy, notably oil. But while oil is a big global market, it is also a highly controlled one. Here's a look at how the oil market functions by the numbers. The world consumes 97.6 million barrels of oil a day, according to the International Energy Agency, and that is expected to increase by 1.8 million barrels a day this year. Of the total, the world needs OPEC countries led by Saudi Arabia produce 25 million barrels a day. And those OPEC members agree on how much to produce or not produce to keep prices where they want them. In the U.S., that has led to a bill called NOPEC, calling for the breakup of the cartel. The bill passed a Senate subcommittee a few weeks ago. But OPEC countries warn the price of oil could easily top $300 if NOPEC is passed, an unintended consequence after new investment in drilling dries up because the price temporarily falls. Still, OPEC this week did agree to pump a little more oil, perhaps a sign it's bowing to the global pressure. One reason oil is back in focus politically, of course, is the price at the pump is such an irritant to consumers. It's not the only place, though, where the argument about competition is made, that too much concentration by a few big players keeps them from dropping prices in a more competitive fashion. Is there some logic to that argument? Hal Singer is managing director of Econ One and an expert on antitrust and consumer protection. Thanks for being with us, Hal. No, thanks for having me. So would more competition create lower prices? Is it as simple as that? I think it would. Now, it's not an elixir. It's not going to eliminate all the inflation that we're seeing. But, but I think that concentration is an accelerant to inflation. It's making things worse. And basically, the basic simple economics is this, that concentrated industries are more susceptible to coordinated pricing. So if there's four firms in the industry, it's much easier to coordinate on a price hike than, if, than uh, if there were, say, 20 firms in the industry. Imagine trying to uh, coordinate across 20 firms would be like herding cats. We know that the pandemic has created inflation, and we've been hearing for a long time. First, a lot of central banks and economists thought it would pass. Transitory was the word. And then, of course, that it's global in nature, beyond our control, supply chain driven. In your view, uh, what component of that is actually companies taking profit, taking advantage of a situation and raising prices, but not necessarily because they have to? Yeah, so I think there's two studies on point here for you. One is uh, by Economic um, Policy Institute, EPI, and they've estimated that about 60 percent of the inflation that we saw in 2021 came from profit taking, as opposed to, say, 6 percent uh, from wage increases. And I've got one other study for you, a Boston Fed study now thinks that the, that concentration has caused firms to pass through cost increases at higher rates. They, in fact, estimate that concentration of the kind that we saw uh, during uh, th this century, just mm -hmm. in the last 20 years, uh, has contributed about 25 percentage points more to pass through of cost increases than would be otherwise. The big test, of course, uh, really around the world on this is kind of the consumer harm. Did prices go up or did they go down, really, just to simplify it? I, we have seen how cases where market domination, Amazon is the one that comes to mind and is often used as an example, has led to lower prices. They acquired Whole Foods uh, but actually made the prices drop at that entity. Is there some argument to made that when you control the market, you can actually reduce prices? Well, Amazon may have lowered uh, distribution costs, you know, relative to whatever preceded Amazon. But as you know, Amazon is, is being sued by various entities right now, allegedly for imposing an inflated take rate on merchants. And that take rate, which goes up every year and, and now requires merchants to buy things like fulfillment from Amazon in order to get into that uh, coveted buy box, uh, is being impounded into the price that merchants are charging on the Amazon uh, platform. So I would, I would push back gently and respectively that Amazon isn't doing its share to contribute to inflation. No, well, fair enough. And we should note that big tech, which got a bit of a hall pass for a while because it wasn't big to begin with, uh, is very much in the focus of, of people in the U.S. when it comes to kind of antitrust and revisiting old ideas about whether things are, are overly dominant. Do you think there's a new era afoot? Will this inflationary period actually lend some power to this idea that a few, a handful of companies shouldn't be dominating a whole uh, sector or a whole landscape? I think that there is a push. I don't know if inflation is going to contribute to this, but, but there is a movement, at least in the U.S., to, to seriously start regulating big tech. You probably are aware of the self-preferencing bill that passed out of the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee 16 to 6. There's a newspaper bill. There's an app store bill. Um, all of those things appear to be moving forward. I don't know if inflation is, is helping prod it along, but there does seem to be an impetus. And the news is, is that uh, rumor is that uh, these things should come out of uh, and pass through, uh, through Congress.
Hal, it's great to have you with us. Appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Hal Singer, antitrust expert, managing director of Econ One. Well, when it comes to competition in Canada, it often seems to take a back seat to other issues like market stability, think of our banking system, or our unique geography, think telecom or airlines. But are Canadians being well served when it comes to forcing businesses to compete? When the Bank of Canada raised rates this week, the major banks all raised their key lending rates to exactly the same level at exactly the same time. Melanie Aiken was Canada's competition commissioner and is now co-head of the Competition Antitrust and Foreign Investment Practice at Bennett Jones. Melanie, great to have you with us. Great to be here. So there's often this complaint, and we talk about oligopolies in this country, uh, in the banking world, in telecom. Uh, do you think that that's a fair complaint, that for a variety of reasons Canada has allowed certain industries to become a little less competitive than they might be? Well, I think just a level set on the conversation you were having with Hal, I think it's important to recognize that absolutely, as he says, you know, competitive markets are less at risk of higher prices when the system takes a shock when there's an overheated economy. But that's not the primary cause of the inflationary experience we're having right now. I mean, certainly far more prominent are the big spending sprees north and south of the border, uh, unprecedentedly so in the United States, uh, an insufficient attention to the shift in demand for services to goods post-pandemic, and the regulatory burdens that have really exacerbated the supply chain bottlenecks, mm -hmm. take the baby formula, instead of you know addressing the FDA's pace the fact um, that they're rigid and they didn't get to their reports about this open and closing plant. Instead, they fly in the military with great fanfare. Well, that's just a U.S. example, but we do the same thing. So I think, you know, it's not, it, this is not the cause. Are there tools on the supply side that maybe uh, we could in the medium and long term have a more competitive economy that would be less vulnerable to these types of shocks? Yeah. Uh, maybe so. One stat that really jumps out at me is uh, the, the stat that two-thirds of publicly traded companies in America have actually seen their profitability expand during the pandemic, not just their pure profit, their margin of profit expand during the pandemic, which says to me, Melanie, they're not just saying, oh, we've got high costs, we have to pass that on to our customer, which would keep their margins the same. They're getting wealthier here, which suggests they're raising prices more than they have to. Well, you know, on any particular example, there could be a whole host of answers to that. I think to get back to your question as to whether, you know, we're too concentrated in Canada, I mean, do we need more antitrust enforcement? I mean, antitrust enforcement is a tool. It's an important tool. We've given a ton more money to the Commissioner of Competition, given a ton more powers they can find to the, to the moon and back now, big companies. But I think, you know, what we have to really be careful about if we're going to address these economic concerns is number one, we need to unshackle Canadian companies and those companies internationally who might like to participate in the Canadian market from the regulatory burden. Mm -hmm. We have an enormous cost imposed on Canadians. You were referring in an earlier piece, um, we have these foreign ownership caps on airlines that nobody can defend except for political purposes. We have a highly concentrated and highly regulated and very cozy banking uh, system in Canada, totally different from the United States. Every time a foreigner wants to invest in Canada, we have a, a grab at goodies just through the Heritage Act or the Investment Canada Act. So there are a lot of things that are diminishing investment in Canada and diminishing competition as a result in Canada. That's in part why we have an oligopolistic uh, economy in a lot of sectors in Canada. We have to really resist, I say, this call, this sort of urge to lurch and go after big as if it's synonymous with bad, uh, to, to sort of attack a visible company that is visible because of its success, because of its innovation, is an attack on innovative spirit, which, to be honest, I've, I've always felt we have um, an insufficient store of in Canada to start with. So we don't want to be going after that. We need to be measured in how we do this and not lurch at big names and big targets, because that's the easy political play. Not lurch. You make an excellent point there. Uh, we want to foster competition, but it sounds like there are some sectors that you would say could stand to be opened up a little bit or rethought. Is now the time to do it? I always think it's the right time to relieve that regulatory burden. Look, there are times you need for public, po different public policy reasons, you know, healthcare, food, water, whatever it be. Of course, you need them highly regulated. But we have so much overregulation in Canada; it has stultified us. If we could just get out of our own way, we would do a lot better. So good to have you, Melanie. Really appreciate it. Great to see you again, Amanda. Melanie Aiken is former Competition Bureau Commissioner and co-head of the Competition Antitrust and Foreign Investment Practice at Bennett Jones. Still ahead, a newly elected government in Ontario is planning to expand long-term care. But is the private for-profit model the way to go? That's still ahead. First, though, this.
Golf isn't a sport that lends itself to the geopolitical, but a dust-up is catching our attention. Pro golfers Dustin Johnson and Graham McDowell are being dumped by major golf sponsor RBC. That after the duo opted to play in a new and controversial Saudi-backed tournament, ditching the Canadian Open to do it. A choice that may prove lucrative for the players, even as other sponsors are backing off golfers who are opting into the Saudi league. But if it's political, it's still diplomatic. RBC said it wishes Johnson and McDowell best of luck in their future endeavors. But let's just agree, that statement usually means the opposite. We're back after this.